I remember the last thing he said to me when I saw him just before we started shooting, he said to me, don't make one of those really boring European art house movies. <laughs> <laughs> The cockpit is not answering their phone. Our number one is in staff, and our five is in staff. I am going to call from Washington. I am in a situation where the American learned a possible hijack. What's going on, Betty? The crap is erratic again. Problem is very erratic. Betty, talk to me. Betty, are you there? Betty? Ready? Now, one of our producers said perhaps a second plane was involved. In okay, hold on. The, the, the people here are, everybody's panicking. All right, what, the building's that, exploding right now. You got people running up the street. Okay. Hold on, I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, am I still connected? The crash of these two aircraft into the towers of the World Trade Center in New York appear to be an act of terrorism. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. A very warm welcome to everybody. Um, we. Um are lucky enough tonight to have uh, two amazing guests here in the Bali, um, Mamadou Old Sly and Kevin McDonald. Um, Kevin McDonald made an amazing movie about the amazing life of uh, Mamadou Old Sly, the Mauritanian. So thank you very much for being here. Um, just first, I'm going to say a little bit more about you, but a little bit further on. But first, if you look at those images, we've seen them, you know, often enough. Mamadou, if you look at that, what what goes through your head? Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you guys for coming here. And uh, I just want to welcome every and each one of you. So I remember w where I was when this happened. I was installing a network server for a human rights uh, or for an organization that helped Mauritania, a German organization that helped Mauritanian. And I was like deep into my work, like, and then this guy, a Mauritanian came to me and said, World War Three, World War Three. I said, what's going on? And then uh, he told me what happened and then I continued. Then I remember uh, after work, it was like 2 p.m., 3 p.m., I went to my cousin. You know him, you met him, Brahim, who invited us to his house. Mm -hmm. And the TV was everywhere. Every TV was about this. And the only thing that I felt was fear. Because back then, I was under house arrest already. Can you remember those? I, I, I remember. I mean, my. My memories of that morning are quite absurd because I was with Mick Jagger in his house and he was wearing a silk dressing gown and we watched the Twin Towers come down <laughs> together. So I know that slightly breaks the somber spell, but uh, that, I'm never going to forget that moment. But um, obviously this, this changed the world. It's a turning point for the world, isn't it? And the movie that I've made, in a way, is as a consequence of Muhammadu being accused of being a part of this. 
And so it's, it's obviously good to start this discussion by seeing that, because if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't be sitting here. He wouldn't have gone through what he went through in Guantanamo. I mean, the world would be, in so many ways, a different place, wouldn't it? Because it did change your life entirely, that moment. Correct. Yeah. Uh, in the blink of an eye, uh, after a couple of weeks after these tragic events, two cops, Mukhabarat, the secret police, came to our house. Of the Mauritanian secret police. Mauritania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The same house that you came to. And because Kevin is very obsessed with like accuracy because he cannot make the difference between making a film and making a documentary. <laughs> so, and he said he wants to shoot the film exactly as it happened. And they came to me. I was working all day long, again, doing networking in the presidency because they had a new system they, and I was in charge of installing it. So, and uh, I was very tired. It was Ramadan and I was fasting. Ramadan is a month where Muslims, you know, don't, uh, so they don't eat in the, uh, during day, but they party all night long. <laughs> Basically, that's what Ramadan is. And I was really tired. And I came, so because they were watching me. So as I came into my house, they told me, we need you to come with us. This is not uh, the Netherlands or the UK where they say, we have a warrant of your arrest. This is because of this and that. No, they just say, you come. And I could see the fear in my mom's eyes. She told me, I know why they come for you. I said, why? She said, because you watch a lot of TV. <laughs> because, you know, we grew up in a military dictatorship and we weren't allowed to say what we want to say. What you take for granted here, it's forbidden for us. And I was led away. So I could see my mom in the rearview mirror. She was, she, she took her tasbih, pray a bit, and she was like shaking and praying like this. I could see her after, I don't know, 200 meters or 150 meters, I don't know whether you remember that. We turned right, and then she disappeared. I never saw her again. So, so this event completely changed my world, you know. But I have to say, because I need to be honest with myself, but all the pain I went through, never having a chance to say goodbye to my mom or my brother who died also, and going through this horrific torture, including sexual assault, everything is worth knowing. So beautiful people like Raja, like Yuri, like Guy and Droni, and I'm just so happy to be in this country. You know, and I know a lot of you guys are not happy to be here, but I don't care. <laughs> because, because I know what it feels like when you don't have freedom. You know? I, know, I know you do, because um, uh, by way of a little bit more inter introduction after we showed these, um, these, these, these images, and also because we decided to put George Bush in the end, because in a way it shows the moment where the world you know, became out of joint, right? because he doesn't really care anymore about justice or not. You know, he, uh, he, we looked for another fragment where he says there's an old saying out west, you know, we want those people dead or alive. So he, on purpose, you know, put a rule of law uh, behind him. So this is the moment where a lot of the world went out of joint, and you were one of its victims. I'm very happy to have you here. Um, Mohamed Oldslai spent 14 years in Guantanamo Bay, um, had been, uh, has never been uh, indicted or trialed, um, has been tortured, and has been put fr free after 14 years without any apology. Um, we're very happy to have you here um, uh, as our artist in residence um, uh, this year, uh, uh, as a writer, um, uh, because uh, you managed to write this book, Guantanamo Diary, um, uh, illegally uh, smuggled out, and an amazing read. I think everybody needs to read this. This is, um, yes, it's gruesome. Um, yes, it's 
But it's so uplifting, it's so amazing that you can actually uh, overcome those things and become uh, the person you are at the moment. So I think <laughs> um, it's a very good idea to read it. Um, yes, welcome, you can come in, let's uh, take a seat. And then um, uh, um, uh, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Kevin MacDonald, who's a director, uh, um, uh, an uh, Oscar-winning and award-winning uh, director, uh, documentary maker and uh, uh, a movie maker, or um, a drama movie maker, um, uh, both on a very, very high level, uh, who uh, took the Guantanamo Diary and uh, made it into an amazing film, The Mauritania. Um, so uh, that movie, uh, um, also uh, starring uh, uh, Cumberbatch and uh, Jodie Foster, um, made an... I think you can see it on Netflix. Do watch it. It's difficult to watch. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, how to um, uh, how to um, also bring uh, those things to to the to the screen uh, because it's horrible things. It's difficult to watch. It's a wonderful movie, um, and that movie um, uh, made it possible, I would say, uh, uh, and the endurance in the first place of Mohamedou to um, uh, get a visa uh, uh, for Holland uh, by um, inviting you as an artist in residence because the Ger the Dutch government in the end uh, could not um, uh, uh, um, um, forbid an artist to come in. So that was sort of a loophole <laughs> to get you here, and that was um, uh, together with uh, Raja El Mohandas, we managed, and with the uh, guy in Rooney, um, we managed to do that. So that now you're here as an artist in residence, and we can have these conversations. Um, that, as a way of introduction, after the first sort of moment where the world went out of joint for you personally, and I would say for a lot of people uh, all over the world. Um, we asked Jochem ten Haaf, one of our um, main uh, actors in Holland, um, and is probably one of the very few to be able, to, as a Dutch speaker, to uh, read in English, to read out a fragment of um, the book of the beginning, or sort of not the beginning, but in, in the first part of the book. Welcome, Jochem. Thank you. A person was undoing the chains on my wrists. He undid the first hand, and another guy grabbed that hand and bent it, while a third person was putting on the new, firmer and heavier shackles. Now my hands were shackled in front of me. Somebody started to rip my clothes with something like a scissors. And I was like, what the heck is going on? I started to worry about the trip I neither wanted nor initiated. Somebody else was deciding everything for me. I had all worries in the world but making a decision. Many thoughts went quickly through my head. The optimistic thoughts suggested, maybe you're in the hands of Americans, but don't worry. They just want to take you home and make sure that everything goes in secrecy. The pessimistic ones went, you screwed up. The Americans managed to pin some shit on you and they're taking you to US prisons for the rest of your life. I was stripped naked. It was humiliating, but the blindfold helped me miss the nasty look of my naked body. And during the whole procedure, the only prayer I could remember was the crisis prayer. Ya hayu, ya kayum. And I was mumbling it all the time. Whenever I came to be in a similar situation, I would forget all my prayers except the crisis prayer, which I learned from life of our prophet, Peace be upon him. One of the team wrapped a diaper around my private parts. Only then was I dead sure that the plane was heading to the United States. Now I started to convince myself that everything is going to be all right. My only worry was about my family seeing me on TV in such a degrading situation. I was so skinny. I've always been, but never that skinny. My street clothes had become so loose that I looked like a small cat in a big bag. When the US team finished putting me in clothes they tailored for me, a guy removed my blindfold for a moment. I couldn't see much because he directed the flash, uh, flashlight into my eyes. He was wrapped from hair to toe in a black uniform. He opened his mouth and stuck his tongue out gesturing me to do the same, a kind of AHH test, which I took without resistance. I saw part of his very pale blonde-haired arm, which cemented my theory of being in Uncle Sam's hands. 
Thank you, Jochem. Um, this is your text, Mahamadou, this is your book. Um, you wrote this years later, but it's obvious also when we speak to you that you remember vividly a lot of those instances. Um, was this the first moment you realized you were really in trouble? Um, I think uh, we always try to adapt to whatever situation we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Every time, you know, it doesn't matter. You got, you know, beaten up. They broke your ribs. You say, ah, I'm going to be okay. This, this is it. And then. <clears throat> So this scene, uh, my brother, Joachim, uh, just read. I remember this. Before this, I spent eight months in darkness. My first black site was Jordan. And I was so happy because they came to me. They say, you're going home. I was crying when they told me going home because I didn't know even what home meant. And then they took me to the airport. I was blindfolded, just like it says, and then they were talking. They spoke in Arabic, and they did not want me to hear them. So they played Abdul Halim Havel. Anyone knows Abdul Halim Havel? Very known singer. Who doesn't know it should know, look it up. It's a very good singer. So, and uh, it was like a win-win situation because they didn't want me to hear them and I did not want to hear them. I love music and I hate people who kidnap other people, so <laughs> I don't want to hear what they had to say, so. But when we arrived at the airport, they start to rip off my closet. And then I know I wasn't going back home, so I know at that moment. Then I started to Regret. It's like my life. Five minutes changed my life. I start to regret, you know, things that I shouldn't have done in my life. And I tell you what I didn't regret. For instance, money did not matter to me at all. Like that I don't have apartment in saint kim arrondissement in Paris did not matter to me. <laughs> so many beautiful women I met who didn't want me, I did not regret them. And then, but I did regret one thing. Every time I made a bad comment to anyone who mattered to me, I regretted that. And I took it upon myself to be a kind person, no matter what. Uh, but I wasn't convinced that I would never see, you know, the life again. But I just said, you know, oh Allah, I prayed, if you give me one more chance, I would be a kind person. And that's why it's so easy for me to forgive. And at least I'm trying my best to forgive. And so far, I am, I think, I invited everybody who hurt me and I told them I forgive them, absolutely, with no question asked. And this makes me a very happy person, you know, because I live in peace with myself. Did you know, Kevin, um, that um, the Americans are, were putting people in prison in Guantanamo Bay, on Bay without trial? Yes. That they, and that they made this place, especially you know, outside of the U.S., to be able to keep people. Yes, I mean the the the, the legal machinations that went on uh, in order to decide to have this prison in Guantanamo Bay in Cuba are extraordinary. I mean that's a whole story, just that. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, the reason that, that the Americans decided, the primary reason why the Americans decided to have this prison for terrorists, for people who had supposedly taken part in the planning of 9-11 or other terrorist attacks on America, the reason they decided to have it there is because they have an, a, a, a naval base in Guantanamo, which is one end of the island of Cuba, 
And this was actually leased by the Americans 125 years ago uh, from the Cubans. And therefore, it's not, strictly speaking, part... It's still Cuba, legally, because it's only leased. It's not owned by America. Uh, and therefore, their lawyers in the White House decided that America could take prisoners there and treat them in a way that they could not legally treat them in the mainland of the United States because it was Cuba. And therefore, all the rule, normal rules did not have to apply. And so they very rapidly put together a, a prison camp there. I think it was built in the course of a week initially. It was a very primitive uh, series of cages initially. And then by the time Mohamedou got there, which was a few months after uh, the prison camp was built, um, it became kind of prefab metal buildings, which um, were welded together very primitively, very tiny cells. If any of you have seen the movie, the cells within, in, in, the, in the movie are pretty much as accurate as we could get as to what they look like in terms of the in terms of the size, the paint color, what the mattress was like, what, what the prisons, prisons were provided with. Because Mohamedou spent a long time with me and with the production designer going through all the details. We'd show him different colors and get him to tell it's that color, but it's maybe this other color underneath it, and this, when the paint chipped off, like this. Because there is no official record. You can't officially get diagrams or photographs, certainly at that time, of the inside of these places. And one of the things that Mohamedou said to us early on was, I want you to make the place as accurate as possible because the American government have spent millions of dollars making sure that people don't know what it's like. So I want people to see what it was like. Um, so, so, yeah, I knew about Guantanamo when I started making this movie. I knew what went on there. I had read some extracts of, of Mahmoud's book when it came out. I hadn't read the whole book. And then I was sent the book by a producer, and they said, you want to make a film out of this? And I read it, and I thought it was astonishing, upsetting, but I couldn't see how you could make a film out of it. Because, you know, as Muhammad has demonstrated now, there isn't, there isn't a simple story here. This story starts, you know, when he's, when he's first a student in Germany in the late 1980s and early 90s. It's goes on, there's one moment where he's like, oh, now I'm screwed. There was many moments after another. It's a very complicated story. It's not, it doesn't lend itself to the simplicity of a film, because films have to be pretty simple, generally. Um, so, and I thought there are enough movies about the war on terror. And the producer said to me, just speak to Mohamedou and you know, see what you think. So I got on a, on, on a Skype call with him, and we chatted for like an hour and a half, and I was... By the time I came off, I thought, the only thing I want to do in the world is to make this movie. Um, I didn't, still didn't quite know how we were going to do it. But he was so, he, he was so um, different than what I expected, I think, more than anything else. He, he, I, I thought I was going to meet someone who was humorless and angry and um, unforgiving. And in fact, it was the opposite in all of those cases. He was someone who was very funny, who speaks better English than I do, who, um, because he's learned English off 18-year-old soldiers, speaks a very particular kind of English as well. And, um, and someone who has an incredible curiosity about the world and an understanding about many different aspects of culture. And... I thought, this person is somebody who needs to be represented on, on screen. And that's what we're going to make the movie about. It's about this person and about this very simple idea, which is the rule of law and what happens when you don't have the rule of law. So we decided that we're going to make a movie which is about Mohamedou and about his lawyers and about trying to make interesting something that seems very maybe theoretical, which is the importance of the rule of law and what happens when the rule of law disappears. That gives me the opportunity. Um, wonderful how you said that it's about the person and about the rule of law. Yeah, mm -hmm. when the portrait is um, uh, yeah. so encouraging. Um, mm. um, that gives me the opportunity to have a look at, uh, we uh, managed to get a fragment from Donald Rumsfeld, uh, the rule of law. 
Um, let's have a look. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. But, excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just wondering I'm not if this going, is an unknown unknown. I'm not going to say which it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the rule of law, huh? and a little bit um, uh, going a little bit further than from the uh, W. Bush um, uh, fragment. Um, this is Donald Rumsfeld, and of course, this footage is uh, he's asked about nuclear weapons in Iraq. But the thinking is the same. Um, 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 uh, he, he liked to turn you from an unknown into a known uh, by all uh, illegal methods. And you know, if, if there's an unknown unknown, it sort of follows from that that we can have uh, methods which are unlawful. And um, uh, uh, sending uh, you to prison for 14 years, uh, for instance, and torturing. Um, how do you look upon Donald Rumsfeld, Mohamedou, if you, you see him here? Uh. Uh, first, uh, I just want to speak like my mind. First, I'm too lazy to understand what he just said. Because I need to think, but I'm too lazy to think. So, <laughs> number, number two, one of the most beautiful comments I saw after the movie was released, you know, some people are uh, very big sport of Donald Rumsfeld. They wrote on Twitter, I sent to, to you this, they wrote, uh, who wrote this shit? You know, <laughs> interrogation. And then one guy came out of nowhere on my feet and said, Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's literally what happened. So, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, Donald Rumsfeld, wasn't, didn't he personally yes, sign he off on your torture? torture. So, so right. in order for them to to break the rule of law, Correct. they needed somebody senior, very senior in his case, to actually put their name to a document, which, he, he which meant that nobody more junior could, could be uh, uh, legally be found responsible for it later on, that the responsibility rested in the White House with him. Yes, so that said, out of respect. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. yeah. Out of respect to his family, uh, I cannot bash him. I cannot say anything ill about him. And uh, the only thing I can say is that any human being who is given this kind of power that the United States has should be held accountable. If they are not held accountable, we will only see catastrophe, whether they're Arabs, whether they're uh, Dutch people, white, black, Muslim, Christian, Jewish people and not affiliated, they always will be corrupted if we don't hold them accountable. And you filed a lawsuit against Rumsfeld. I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and against George W. Bush. And against Bush, yeah, two of the most powerful people in Correct. the world. Correct. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the film is about the rule of law, uh, Kevin mm. just said, and it is, it is. It's about mm. the power of law. Mm. And it's about that the law keeps us free um, uh, if it's uphold. Mm. And if it's not, it's not. Mm. Aren't you now suing the um, Canadian government? Yes, I'm going to be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and. I have a lot of friends here coming to see me, and as soon as I get those millions, I will wipe you out of my... <laughs> <laughs> and I will have like a secretary or somebody who is going to answer, and she will have a British accent. <laughs> um, we're going to have a first look of one of the fragments we um, um, yeah. um, uh, took from your, your movie. Mm. Fragment, um, uh, first fragment on... Um, uh, since when do we look people, lock people up in this, uh, uh, without trial in this country? Um, mm -hmm. If we can have a look at it. Uh, 
we saw the law firm where Nancy Hollander um, is, uh, was working, uh, mm -hmm. Jodie Foster, mm -hmm. and um, you know, um, she wants to um, start looking into Mohamedou's case. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful scene, I think, because you realize that indeed if, if, if somebody is not wanting to uphold the law, you know, you're, you're out in the outer darkness, literally. Um, but also that they, her law firm, which was based in New Mexico, of all places, it's not the center of the universe, Albuquerque, mm -hmm. New Mexico, that uh, they had to think about very hard, and obviously much harder than is <laughs> presented in the film, about the consequences of doing this. At the time in 2003 where to say that you were representing somebody who was accused of terrorism, who was in Guantanamo, could you know, end your business and make you incredibly unpopular. And so, and you know, Jody does a very good impression, I think, of Nancy, who I've got to know quite well in the years we were making the movie, in that there's a kind of cussed, I don't give a shit what you think, I'm just gonna do this attitude to Nancy, isn't there? Um, she's not really worried about being popular. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what you need yes. in this sort of situation. It is, it is. And, um, um, but it also shows that um, the American democracy and more, more even the rule of law was really damaged, really damaged. Uh, the whole story shows that. So yeah. in a way you could say in a very sad way, and you actually said this once to me um, earlier uh, last winter, that one of the bad things is that America uh, should be proud of you know, being a democracy with a rule of law. Um, so in a way you could say, and I'm wondering what you both think of that, in a way you could say that the terrorists, by bombing these two buildings, in fact won, because they managed to make America act unlawful uh, uh, um, and well, to betray their own ideals yeah. I mean yeah. you know America the heart of the Constitution at the heart of all Western democracies is meant to be the idea that the rule of law is paramount and certain kinds of governments like George Bush's and like our own in Britain I'm afraid to say at the moment with Boris Johnson who's trying to send uh, refugees to Rwanda and complaining when uh, lefty liberal lawyers prevent him from doing it and try and s stir up the population to be uh, angry and resentful at the lawyers who are doing their job and abiding by the law. Those are you know, incredibly dangerous situations and I think those people don't realize where that can lead and it can lead to the kind of thing that happened to Mohamedou. Yeah, because they managed to destroy not only those two buildings but the rule of law. Mm. Yeah, so those heavy stuff, this is very heavy stuff. I it want is. to share with you some what happened here when we were shooting. So, <laughs> <laughs> so please do. Jody Foster is the nicest person, and I think you know this is not very common among actors because actors really tend to be. And I'm not talking about Yoham. <laughs> but they, they tend to be a little bit, you know, they see themselves as... A little narcissistic. Yeah, some, yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, big word. So, and, uh, and she made me feel so comfortable, and I told her, I had a crush on you. <laughs> and then uh, she told me what the movie I liked most. It was uh, Maverick, the Maverick. Anyone watch the Maverick? Which, by the way, is Jodie Foster's worst movie. She hated that movie, she said, you know? <laughs> she hated it. And, uh, but she told me it's so common that so many people love that movie, you know? And she's just so kind, and she's like a child. Mm -hmm. You know, when she talks, she's like a child. We went to this restaurant, very fancy restaurant. You know what fancy means? They rip you off. <laughs> I mean, they give you very little food, and then, <laughs> This chef come to you, said, uh, bonjour, uh, Amis Bush. I said, I don't want Amis Bush. I want food, you know? And then he wants me to believe that this is for free. I said, I just paid $100, dude, you know? <laughs> this is, so I love uh, all the actors, by the way, but I didn't love where they eat. So I'd rather go to dinner, kebab, or to some Moroccan restaurant, you know, and just, just, fill myself up. So she is really a very kind person, you know. And uh, it's very 
very saddening that people like her don't even know what Guantanamo Bay is. Americans are living in a parallel world. You know, this is almost like communist propaganda. They told them, we're sending our soldiers to Iraq to keep you free and to save the free world. And this is not only America. Even the Netherlands, one of the most liberal countries, they also helped the United States break the rule of law. Unfortunately, I know this first-hand information, not second-hand information, you know? And so we are betraying democracy, all of us. So it's not only America. It, it's a nice way of putting it that you know it from first hand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you have suffered it for 14 years, you could say that. Yeah. Um, um, let's let's get in a little bit into um, uh, the process of writing a book and making a film and making a story into a story into another story and see what mm. see what. Um, um, uh, Tahir Rahim, Jodie Foster, Shilin Woodley, and Benedict Cumberbatch are four of the sort of actors. There's many more great actors, and it's, it's amazing amount of good actors in it. Mm. Um, let's let's see uh, let's see one a, a fragment. A goodbye to your mother, which you already mentioned. It's um, one of the biggest regrets, um, uh, understandably. But look at this scene, and look at uh, uh, Tahir Rahim uh, mm -hmm. playing mm -hmm. um, Mahamadou. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things I should say about that scene is that it is shot actually in the, in the place where it actually happened to Mohamedou. That is the outside of his mother's house. So I think it's very powerful seeing that that is the exact place, the gates, the... So it feels very real, I think, for him. Yeah. It is the actual place. It's so the actual yeah. place in, in the suburbs of Nouakchott where he grew up, where his mother lived. There's, you know, there's his gates. We, we filmed as much as we could of the Mauritanian sections of the film. In fact, all the Mauritanian sections of the film are filmed in Mauritania in the places where they happened as much as possible. Yeah. So Tahar is French of Algerian descent, and so in, in, in uh, Mauritania, they speak a language called Hassani, which is a form of Arabic, which is very, very different than, uh, than anything that he speaks, than Algerian, certainly. And so he had to learn phonetically every word. And Mohamedou would actually train him to say every line. And then he had to post-sync a lot of it later because he got it wrong or there was engines over it or whatever. And, he had to, and Mohamedou was his dialogue coach and spent a lot of time with him, you know, teaching him the right words, the right language, but also they spoke a lot before we filmed on, on Zoom and, that, and Tahar, being a great actor, picked up little nuances of who Mohamedou is in the way he acted, the way that he spoke. He often go, as you said, Mohamedou's got this thing, he always says, you know, you know, <laughs> in a very American way. And Tahar started, started, started doing that. Um, for those of you who don't know him, Tahar is actually uh, very well known in France and around the world, really, for a performance he did in a film called Un Prophet, a Jacques Audriard film, which is amazing if you haven't, if you haven't seen it, which he also plays an imprisoned man, <laughs> strangely. Um, and <coughs> he was the first person involved in the film. When I, when I decided I was going to make it, I, the producer says to me, who can play Mohamedou? And I said, there's only one person. And if he doesn't want to do it, we can't make the film, uh, literally. And uh, I phoned up my, um, Tahar and said, who I'd, I'd worked with before and I knew. And I said, look, there's this, great, there's this great, amazing story in this man. And he said, I don't want to do anything to do with the war on terror, he said. And I said, no, no, I promise you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna want to do it. And I sent it to him. He read it. And he's like, I'm in. So he was the first person to, to, to sort of help us get it made, you know, to use his, his star power to get it made. Mm. So you knew from the start that you wanted to have him? Yeah, because it needed to be somebody who has, you know, Mohamedou is incredibly charismatic, but also incredibly sweet. 
you know, and has a cheekiness and a humor, which Tahar also has as a person. They share a lot of, a lot of characteristics. And also, there aren't, there aren't that many actors of Arabic origin who are experienced enough or good enough, I guess, to do it, whether they have a reputation or not. You know, I did look at other people because there was a time actually where, because the film was hard to get financed, it collapsed once, and then uh, when we got it going again, it looked like Tahar was not available. And so I had to look for other somebody else, and it was just, I looked and there was nobody else. So then we somehow made it work around his schedule. Um, and in fact, we shot the film completely out of, out of schedule. We did all of Jody first, sorry, all of Benedict first, because he was only available for two weeks at the beginning, and then Tahar was only available at the end, and then poor old Jody was the one, you know, the biggest star of them all, really, was the one who had to sit around waiting for everyone else <laughs> to, to, be, to be there. But I, I think one of the things that's a testament also to Muhammadu is that when we went to all of these great actors, uh, when they read the book, when they heard the story, when they spoke to him, as they, you know, I used Muhammadu as my secret weapon to cast them all. I'd say, just speak to Muhammadu. And they'd get off the phone and say, oh, I want to do the film. Um, and they all did it for really no money at all. And that was you know, very, uh, you know, very much a testimony to the, to the power of Muhammadu and the power of his story. They all did it. Well, I'll tell, I, I mean, I think Jodie Foster was the highest paid. She got two hundred thousand dollars. It's not not paid, but in her league, it's yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's 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 nothing. And and uh, you know, I think Benedict was paid a lot less than that, and he gave his money back to finish the film because we couldn't finish the film. We didn't have enough money, so they all really did it out of a desire to, you know, have Muhammadu's story be told. So, and I think a lot of actors. You know, they they feel like they want to make a difference, and obviously sometimes that can be cringe making, and you go, oh God, don't don't make these worthy films. But other times, I think you know, it's it's it's, it's wonderful. They want to use their star power. There was also an interesting thing with Jody actually, which was at the beginning of 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 me trying to persuade her to do the film. She hadn't acted for a number of years. She was pretty much retired from performing, and she she she. Um, her mother died, and I met her like two weeks later, and her mother had been quite old, her mother had been her manager, and she said to me, you know, um, I think I'm going to do the movie because my mother always told me, don't act for anything but money. <laughs> and now mm -hmm. she's gone, I feel like I can do something that I really want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and also she actually said that she had, she, her mother had taken her the on the uh, to the mosque when she was young. Her mother had briefly converted to Islam in the 70s in LA and had taken, had taken Jody a few times to the mosque. And so she was really intrigued. I'm not surprised that she's Muslim and she likes money. <laughs> <clears throat> um, how do you, if you look at yourself, Mohamedou, uh, in, the, in the movie, um, is it... A sort of a nice or a weird experience, to, to, or an impossible experience. Or did you did you look did you watch the whole movie, uh, or didn't you? It took me uh, a very long time to uh, watch the whole movie because there are scenes that are very violent. Yeah. And uh, actually, I, I don't like uh, to watch violence in movies in any movie. So. But let alone like violence that was visited upon me, you know. And like he said, it's very accurate. Actually, what they say, they actually did say that in like word for word. And I just, because I hate to leave the big elephant in the room without being mentioned. Mm -hmm. So when I met Tahar Rahim in first time in South Africa, Everybody was saying, yeah, you guys look alike. I was like, of course, all brown people look alike. <laughs> and, but, you know, Raja, we don't really look alike, but to all of those white people, we really look alike. So, <laughs> so this is, was easy casting for them. <laughs> so, and, uh, and I mean, 
uh, Kevin insisted that he really needs uh, Taha Rahim because Taha Rahim really was the closest actor who spoke French, he spoke Arabic, he spoke English, and he is from the same region like where I am from. So this is the closest you can get because they were talking about casting a, a Pakistani also. I mean, they also look like us, obviously. <laughs> so, yeah. So, when I look at the movie, I don't look whether it's, it's me or not me, I just... Uh, I'm just happy that my story is being told and reach more people. And I'm sitting here because, talking to, because I'm in a, a privileged situation. But people, other detainees, they cannot talk to you. They cannot travel and come to you. They cannot even make an interview because they will be threatened. I know that because I was threatened too. They ransacked my apartment when we talked. In Mauritania? Mauritania. Mm -hmm. They stole my money too, which was not professional, professional actually. <laughs> so I'm just saying, so you need, we need to think about those people who cannot speak for themselves. And Amsterdam is where people need to express themselves. And you know, this is exactly the right place. I just want to, to talk for those who cannot talk for themselves. I'm very privileged and I'm aware. Was that the reason also to go along with the movie? That it could be shown probably in places where people cannot speak for themselves? First, the movie was already signed when I was in prison. I mean, once they came to me, Richard Zuli, the, the boss of the torture team, he came to me, he said, we will kidnap your mother, and she will be, insinuate she will be uh, assaulted sexually. That was like my abyss. Because you believed them as well, of course. Yeah, because they did it to yeah. other people I know of them, other detainees. And so anything after that, I could only get better. And when they came to me, they say, everything they tell me, I say, yes, 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 yes. And <laughs> everything, I never said, uh, and I never imposed any ideas. You see, he doesn't tell you everything because it's a lot, but movie is very hard to do. Like this scene, like it's not even one minute, all night long, <laughs> all night long, we shot we this. And the script goes through a lot and a lot of people say, no, I don't want this. Everybody wants to look good in the movie. <laughs> I want to look good too. But I never told him one time, never, not even one time did I tell him, change this, did this, I never. This, this is true, this is true. And, and, you know, the other characters, Nancy Hollander, who's played by Jodie Foster, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Colonel Couch, who, who is played by Benedict Cumberbatch, they both, I sent them the script and they would come back and say, I don't want this, well, I can't say that, I would never do this. Um, and I wanted to say to them, it's not about you, this film, really. It's about something that really happens. Um, but <coughs> a lot of negotiations. And obviously you don't want to upset, upset people, but a movies that are two hours long or whatever, you know, trying to tell a story that takes place over someone's entire lifetime. And, uh, has many different characters, many different time frames. It's a complicated piece of machinery that's got to appear very simple, otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't work. So you do simplify things and you simplify characters greatly. And they, the, the, um, uh, Nancy Hollander and Stuart Couch, wonderful, intelligent people, but they did not understand this, that you have to simplify it and you have to fictionalize lightly things. Mohamedou, had watched so many movies, I think, in, in, in Guantanamo, that he was much more uh, movie savvy, much more sophisticated about his understanding. It's got to be a movie, I understand that. 
And I remember the last thing he said to me when I saw him just before we started shooting, he said to me, don't make one of those really boring European art house movies. <laughs> make it something that's going to entertain people. And I sort of you know, tried to take that into account. I think there's a, you, know, you want to make a movie that people want to watch, even though it's a movie which is about something really unpleasant and difficult and it's about torture, ultimately. And so you're always balancing. And, I, and thinking about who the audience are for a movie like this. Who do you want to watch it? And uh, my feeling was, and maybe wrongly, was to try and make a kind of mainstream movie, to try and make a movie that would appeal to people on not just the progressive left wing and the kind of people who already agree with me and already agree with the idea of human rights, but also something that might appeal to people on the other side who want to just watch a movie, who have a character in Benedict Cumberbatch who is a Republican, who is a... Who, who, who is a member of the, 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 the kind of right wing in America and a member of the military. And so that they have a way into the movie as well, so that they can see, oh, actually, this isn't just a one-sided film. But of course, those sort of decisions, you can make a movie, you can make a movie that is just for the audience who already you know are going to agree with it, and they'll probably love it. Or you can make a movie where you're trying to reach out to persuade other people. And I think this is the only time in my life I've ever made a film which has genuinely been polemical. You know, it's genuinely been trying to s sell a message to people and to sell it to as wide an audience as possible. And there are, have been a few instances where people have got in touch with me and said, you know, I'm a soldier. I was a soldier in the, in the, in the, in the American army at this time and I've changed my mind from watching the movie. And those are the, those people who have, Got in touch with that's the people I really value in a way. Not that I don't value all of you, of course. But I kind of think that actually, therefore, you are, in a very tiny way, you can, the movie can make a little difference. Um, just reaffirming people who already know these things, I don't know how valuable that is ultimately. Um, it is a movie about torture, in a way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, 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 I think it does reach huge audiences because, um, because <laughs> Muhammad, who rightly, maybe or uh, interestingly said, you know, try to make one of those movies which are interesting to uh, a huge amount of people. You know, mm. not, not one of the art house boring mm. uh, movies we, we play in the Bali. We do a lot of art house, <laughs> yeah, boring European movies, but uh, do something which really appeals to, to, to big masses, which is right because big masses need to know this story. I think mm. it's ab absolutely right. Mm. Um, but uh, a lot of questions from this. Um, um, Mohamed, um, because he said, it, it took me a very long time to watch it, huh? um, which I can understand. I could even, I mean, I can't even imagine how you managed to watch it. Um, uh, but doesn't it, in a way, feel very, very difficult, at least, to say the least, um, that um, out of your torture and torture in general comes entertainment? an entertaining movie, which it is in mm. the Hollywood sense of the word. And mm. I think you need to get people's attention. Yeah. So in order to get someone's attention, you need to entertain them. I'm not going to open the door and say, ah, oh, they torture me, they broke my head. What the fuck are you doing here? Get the fuck out of my house. You know, but they need to have some kind of context. And, um, and it's a story. And the story has to entertain and to make you feel like pain, empathy, you know, anger. That's a story. I'm a Bedouin. And I grew up with stories, storytelling. Mm -hmm. We wrote Thousand and One Nights. <laughs> and I remember when I was reading, you know, there was this story about these two lovers. And the, the, and the guy died. And I was a child, I cried. I didn't think that was not a true story. And then I kept reading, and then they found this doctor who could bring people back from the dead. Ma'ul Hayat, the water of life. And then I was so happy that the story would have a good end and then the guy would be brought back from the dead. So I know the power of a story. 
And, and the story, like those contradictory things that you said, entertaining, painful, I think that's some of the ingredients of a story. Mm -hmm. mm. I, um, we have a fragment of, um, of, uh, of your book um, about those things. Um, I'm going to ask Jochem ten Haaf to uh, read it for us and we can listen to it and discuss afterward. I don't think we're going to have a look at the scenes from the movie, but rather listen to your description of it mm. and okay. uh, talk a little bit more about the problem of mm. Jochem. I was just wishing to pass out so I didn't have to suffer. And that was really the main reason for my hunger strike. I knew, of course, people like these don't get impressed by hunger strikes. Of course, they didn't want me to die, but they understand there are many steps before one dies. You're not gonna die, we're gonna feed you up your ass, said Staff Sergeant Mary. I've never felt as violated in myself as I had since the DOD team started to torture me to get me to admit things I hadn't done. You, dear reader, could never understand the extent of the physical and much more the psychological pain people in my situation suffered, no matter how hard you try to put yourself in another person's shoes. Had I done what they had accused me of, I would have relieved myself on day one. But the problem is that you cannot just admit to something you haven't done. You need to deliver the details, which you can't when you haven't done anything. It's not just, yes, I did it. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to make up a complete, complete story that makes sense to the dumbest of dummies. One of the hardest things to do is to tell an untruthful story and maintain it. And that is exactly where I was stuck. Of course, I didn't want to involve myself in devastating crimes I hadn't done, especially under the present circumstances, where the US government was jumping on every Muslim and trying to pin any crime on him or her. We are going to do this with you every single day in and out, unless you speak about Abdul Malek and admit to your crimes, said Staff Sergeant Mary. Thank you, Jochem. Um, there are many more scenes like this in the book and in mm. the movie as well. Of you. And there's, there's even more difficult scenes you write or you film. Um, but this one also, Mohamedou, um, you write, you, dear reader, could never understand the extent of the physical and much more the psychological pain people in my situation suffered, no matter how hard you try to put yourself in another, sh in another shoes. Which I think is very, very true. It's also very, I think, literally beautiful how you turn to the reader and you know address him uh, directly because it's one of the moments where you need to think, you know, about yourself. Um, that's probably, I mean, most probably. I know for myself it's true that I can't, you know, uh, fathom the, the the depth of what's happening there. Um, but what? What are you hoping for, Mohamedou, if you, if you write those things? What are you hoping for in your audience or in your... I, I think... I don't know. I, I think we need some kind of societal approval, I guess. I don't want to be a bad guy, so yes, let's be clear about that. So... And, so, so many days they tell me every day that I killed other people, that I'm a bad guy, that mm -hmm. Muslims are evil people. And this is, I live the fantasy of every writer. Because when you go to America or to the Arab world, you talk to people. People don't talk to you openly because they always want to be polite. But. When I was captured, people did not need to be polite to me. They told me in my face, we hate you, and we hate everything you represent. And I was like, good to know. In my head, I didn't say anything. 
And then I know like, it was like so like refreshing to me that people talk to me so openly. And so, and I didn't want, uh, at certain point, I hated my face. I didn't want to look in the mirror. I didn't have a mirror, but sometimes when they drag me, then there are like reflecting surfaces, and then I close my eyes. Because the person that they described to me, I don't know. You know, and I hated my culture. I hated everybody. So when I see an American person, I see the good guy, very well dressed. Everything is ironed. You know, very well like maintained the hair, everything. When I see an Arditini, I say, this is the devil. When I see an Arab or a Muslim, I say, this is the devil. But it's day in, day out. So I guess it would be so, so shameful if my family live with the prospect. You know my family, you met them. You know, you stayed with them, you ate with them. They took you to their places, so. And uh, I, just, I just want to tell like people like, who are not from this culture that we are not really that different, you know. And I have a secret. I'm obsessed with the uh, extremist uh, narrative. I watch a lot of Fox News, <laughs> but I'm alone. <laughs> I, I don't watch it in front of other people. <laughs> because I really want to understand this narrative. And when I came to the Netherlands, I watch Geert Wilde so much. <laughs> and I was saying, I was talking to him without him. I said, what happens if all Moroccans die tomorrow? What job would you have? <laughs> because he was so obsessed. And I, I love this thing when people are so obsessed with something, you know. And I always tell people, if you hate Moroccan, just eat Harira. And then you will be cured the next day. <laughs> because they really make so good harira, you know? <laughs> and I guess I just wanted to, I just, you know, I have vested interest in peace and that people don't hurt each other. That's all. That's why I really want to address people. And I want cultures to talk, to understand each other, you know? Because, again, you know, a little bit about Mauritanian. Mm. What, the first thing that he said in our premier in Mauritania, you know, Yuri, what he said? He does not pre uh, prepare speeches. So that's first, he doesn't prepare any speech. He said that he was so shocked that Mauritanian women are so strong and so powerful and so independent, or something like that. His English is much better than mine. But that's the second person that, saying yeah. this tonight. <laughs> so is that what that's you said? the second person saying this. Yeah, you can share with them. You can share with them. Well, I, I mean, I, I'll talk about my opinions of Mauritanian women in a minute. Not that they're very valuable. Not that they're very valuable. But, I mean, I think what Mohamedou is saying is, goes to the heart of things because, in two ways. One, because when you read Mohamedou's book, and if you're lucky enough to meet him as well, you realize that, he has a superpower, and that superpower is empathy. And even at the worst, most extreme moments in this book, he's curious about the other person who's with him. So if that person is a torturer, he's trying to talk to them and say, you know, where did you grow up? Why are you doing this job? Why would you join the military? Are you a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? And he's genuinely interested in what the answer that, those, that that person is going to give. And I think that curiosity and that empathy are really what the movie and what the book, in a way, are trying to do, because they're trying to humanize a group of people or an individual who represents a group of people who are, have been determinedly dehumanized for the last 20-something years. Um, if you come out of reading Mahamadou's book or watching the movie and you feel, oh, I really like that guy, he's like me, you know, 
I, I, I feel for him when he suffers. I laugh with him. Um, I like his taste in sitcoms or not. Um, that's success. Just to be able to say, ah, oh, he's a human being like me. He's not an alien. He's not an other. He's not so culturally different just because he's Muslim. And I think that is the simple aim of both the book and the film, isn't it, Mahandu? Absolutely. I mean, we need to share our stories because, mm. you know. And then another elephant in the room, and because you, um, I don't even gonna show them here. I think if you're interested in read the book or see the movie, but um, but you this you um, uh, as a director um, put in several scenes where there's horrible things happening. There's mm -hmm. a real torture, and I think you're commanded for it because it's done in a way that you can actually, I mean, you're shocked, but it's, it's, it's not sensational or whatever. But knowing Mohamedou and directing it, and was it for you, I mean, it's what directors do. It's, you know, you can see thousands of movies with it, but, but now it's your personal friend. And now... Yes, and that was, in a way, uh -huh. that was the idea of the movie, was to, by the time you get, the, 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 the sequence of torture is all happens really in one section, and it's three quarters of the way through the movie. Yeah. The idea is that unlike Zero Dark Thirty or other American movies that have been made about the war on terror, that you have got to know this person yeah. and you've got to love him and then you see this happen to him. And we'd had so many discussions, myself, the producers, the financiers, about how much torture we want to put in. Do we want to put none in? Do we want to put nothing and just sort of go to black? play some violent music and then we see him afterwards? Or do we want to, do we have an obligation to show at least some representation of what, of what happened? Um, I came down very much on the side of that we needed to show something because the book, that is, a lot of the book is about the detail of what happened to Mohammedu. a lot. I don't know, 40%, something like that. And it felt like it was important for people to understand that and to know that those things that you see in the film actually happened. And the, the movie is full of, you know, little lies, little fictionalizations, little simplifications of things. But when it came to the torture sequence, we tried to make everything something that actually happened. And every word that somebody says is what was said as, as per Mohamedou's book. And then also as, as per American uh, government documents, which were then subsequently released. Um, so it hopefully becomes a kind of documentary representation. And we didn't, we didn't show too much violence, I don't think, but it, it is, feels very violent because you know this person and you know he's going through the most horrific experience. So it's not, it's not a movie where you see, you know, somebody being repeatedly punched or repeatedly um, stabbed or... And it, it, it's mostly in your mind, and it's the, the sound and the image of his face, knowing what he's going through, that I think gives the, the, the power to it. But it is a very, it's a very, very complicated thing, and I've sat next to Mohamedou in the premiere we had in, in Mauritania and felt terrible when that sequence came up, because Mohamedou, I think, previous to that, had not watched that sequence. And he felt that, and I said to him, you should leave now. And he said, no, I have to stay because it was like an official thing and he felt he had to stay and I think you closed your eyes, but still, you know, you're listening to it. And you feel like you're being exploitative and you feel like you're, you know, as the filmmaker that you've done something which oversteps the mark because I know and care for Mohamedou and I don't want to do anything that's going to upset him and hurt him. Um, so I don't think, I don't, I don't know whether we got it right, I really don't. Um, we made a set of decisions at the time but there are arguments. There are arguments both ways. I mean, I, I think one of the things I would say about this Mamadou's whole story is that there are so many different ways we could have got into it. There's so many different films we could have made out of his story. Yeah, and we could have made a story which had nothing to do with torture, and maybe yeah. that would have been the right one. It might have. It might have got a bigger audience to 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 to, to, to empathize with him. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. It's also. I think um, it's very painful to watch 
also because I know you, but it's also very painful to watch because it's our democracy and our rule of law which is actually doing that. We are not American, you're not American, you're British, I'm Dutch, mm -hmm. but it's our allies, it's our, it has been you know, our war, our Western world. And a lot of people are in denial still. A lot yeah. of people in America would watch this movie or have watched this movie and gone, that's not true, that's fictional. I don't believe that those lines can't. It's just it's this is all made up, and people get very angry about it. But particularly, people get angry about the sequences which have w women guards involved. Yeah, and they say that can't be true. And as you read the book, obviously you, you see that it that, that it is true. Um, but it's interesting. That's the thing that sort of really people can't accept. Yeah, it's painful to watch because you see your own rule of law being destroyed, mm. I think, because it's our time, it's our... Well, we like to think yeah. that we're, we're better than that. And if we did see that happen in a film that was made in Jordan or made in Saudi Arabia, we would think, oh, yeah, of course. But to see that is actually have to acknowledge, no, that's, that's, we think we're, we're better than that, but we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> that's, yeah. And that's that's the other part of. I mean, everybody's human. That's a very powerful message of. Well, you're challenging but, the propaganda yeah, that people yeah. have been, you know, uh, taking in with their mother's milk since they were tiny. They, they kind of sense of, you know, this is what we represent as as a democracy. These are the things we do and we don't do. We always wear the white hat. Other people wear the black hat. Um. Let's take a little, little look at Benedict Cumberbatch, also because he's acting very, very well, and it's, a, I think, a <laughs> crucial scene. Um, uh, Benedict is also a producer on the film, I should say, and he, he was absolutely crucial to getting the film made. Yeah, he's, yeah. yeah I saw... He was he, really committed. It was his company who bought the rights to the book originally and who, who came to me. To give a bit of context to that, um, so Stuart Couch, Colonel Couch, who Benedict plays, uh, was a uh, military prosecutor who was given Mohamedou's case to prosecute. And incredibly, he was given this case despite the fact that one of his closest friends had been the co-pilot of a plane that flew into 9-11. So he was encouraged to be vengeful, encouraged, he was chosen because he had a personal emotional stake uh, in, this, in this story, um, which is in, in, you know, incredible to me that the, <laughs> that the it's American legal... It's as mean legal, as it can get. It's as mean as it can get. Yeah. So you're hoping that somebody's going to be blind to all the flaws, moral and legal, in, in, in the case because they're bent on hell, bent on revenge. Uh, and actually, to Couch's incredible credit, he did stand up like this and say, no, I'm not going to take this case. This is, this is bent, it's crooked, this is wrong, it's not what America stands for, it's what we should stand for. And uh, he walked out on it. And, and it, I was talking to Mohamedou just before we started here, and amazingly, he just met Stuart Couch a week ago in Geneva. And maybe you should take over and tell what, say what happened when you met him. Yeah, so... This was the, the public prosecutor, huh? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he was the military prosecutor. He is a, His name is Colonel Couch. He's a, a Marine, a pilot. And uh, he's like a very religious person. And so when this was happening, I did not know him, so he was not allowed to see me. So they sent me one of his colleagues, his name was First Sergeant Charlie. And he sat in front of me, they took me out of my cell, and he sat about less than one meter away from me, maybe here. And then they sat me, and he was talking to me, he informed me that I was going to be executed. And he was going through the details. And I was like a stone. Like, you would ask how I felt. I had no feeling. I wasn't 
like scared, but I wasn't also not scared. I was only thinking one thing. I just wanted to go back to myself. And I want him to finish his story because at that point I was broken and I signed my false confession based on which they want death penalty. And I created a world, a fantasy world in my head. And everyone, everybody, everyone someone talks to me, it disturbs my world. And I always wanted to be in my cell alone with no one. So after so many years, he, they invited me to uh, Geneva. And he was really a very kind person. He, uh, he, uh, he apologized, he made photos with me. And he, uh, he just was so happy that the movie was out and that the story that he didn't kill me because that would have been a tragedy. You know, you kill someone who didn't do anything, you know. And uh, I, uh, I signed his book, his copy, and I wrote him, uh, safety first, put the needle away, we've got work to do. <laughs> so this is military parlance. So safety first, actually the slogan of uh, the US Army, safety first. Because he said that he would put the needle in me. Actually, he said that. And so he said that that's a quote of himself. He said he would personally put the needle in me, the lethal. And this is only the power of freedom of speech, the power of you know, art, that the story is out, and, the, and that I'm speaking to you guys. And I'm just so very grateful. I'm very overwhelmed with gratitude and that anything I would say it would not make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think it's a very powerful line. Huh? Um, someone needs to answer for it. Not yeah. just fucking anyone, but not just fucking anyone. And out of, out of the one crime comes the next crime. I think this scene is wonderfully putting together what it is. If you don't have a personal morality to break that sequence, then out of the first crime comes the, f the next crime. And if the system takes that over, then, the, then, then, it's, uh, uh, then everything's gone in a way. I think it's a very, very powerful. <laughs> mm. um, I uh, think that, you so know, Couch also represents the kind of the flaw in the system, which is that if you're part of the military, if you're part of the, the, the government legal system, it's very, very hard to turn against the tide because the flow is all <laughs> going this way. You're being told this is the right thing to do. This is the moral thing to do. This is the patriotic thing to do. And to turn around and go against that in any way at all Particularly at this 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 period, is is you know, it takes real it takes real strength and real courage. And it, as Mohammedu said, he's a religious man, and the moment he read he read the documents, which effectively proved that Mohammedu had been tortured and that his confession had come about through torture. And he had been thinking, okay, I have to just go ahead with the prosecution anyway. I'm going to bury this and not acknowledge it. Good ringtone. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, "I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just bury it." But then he went to church, and there was a christening happening in the church. Uh, it's exactly as it happens in the movie. And he heard them say in the church some line about, which is, a, I think, from one of the gospels. I'm not a religious man myself, but uh, uh, it's, it's something about, you know, all people are born innocent, and uh, everyone deserves a fair hearing. And he heard this and he thought, well, you know, we're all God's creatures. I, I, I can't do the wrong thing. I have to stand up and say, you know, this man has been tortured, the evidence is tainted. And so that's, that's what he did. And it affected his career. And so he, you know, he made a sacrifice for it. But is it, you know, when you meet him, he's, the, he's a very decent guy, isn't he? Yes, this is all, again, like, Anyone 
who is not subject to the rule of law, is not su subject to scrutiny, is going to be corrupt. Mm. You know, this doesn't matter how religious you are, how unreligious you are. And he was just given a free reign. If he had killed me, no one would have asked any question. No, of course not. So. It would have been on his conscience, though. I think that's the point, yeah, is that he, he had to take a personal decision because the system yes. was, was not going to prevent this. And that's happy for me and sad for the world. Yeah. Because you, need, you, you cannot have like everyone like being honest. You have to have the system that control people. Exactly. Hold everybody accountable. No, democracy is here for a reason, not just because we enjoy like electing stupid people. <laughs> We're going to look at the last fragment, um, a speech at the end of the of the end of the movie, mm. and um, looking for questions afterwards. And a few questions here. But the, the, this speech at the end is is um, almost exactly what Mohammedu said. And it's very closely based on, on what he actually said when he went to trial. Let's have a look. Um, this is still true, isn't it? You're saying. You're yes. saying that today, yesterday, tomorrow. Yes, you, you know, one journalist in this beautiful country asked me a question. He said, Mohammed, you are here, but you know, some people hate you. I said, that's their problem, not my problem. <laughs> They're the one who needs to go to a psychiatrist. But from here, I'm going to drink a cup of tea and I'm going to sleep with clear conscience. So we need to free ourselves from hate and from you know, just like, uh, you know, just, we just need to live in peace with ourselves, you know, by just letting go and seeing beyond people's actions. Thank you very much for coming. And of course, um, uh, um, thank you very much, um, Jan de Mosselman and Veronica Baas, editors of the Bali, for putting this evening together. Um, I'm taking, I thought it was very emotional. Um, thank you for the questions and thank you for the tears. I, I couldn't help myself. Um, I take away a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of wonderful thoughts and sayings. I have a vested interest in peace. Yes, we all have, of course, we all have. You know, we don't want to end up somewhere beaten or in war. You know, we have a vested interest in peace. Let's try to do something about it. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, uh, I believe if you hate a group of people, you hate humanity. Yes, of course, of course. If, you, if you're able to hate groups, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's also so obvious. Um, and I do not preach, I tell stories. And that's for a director of the Bali, I think, the most beautiful <laughs> thing to, to hear. Yes, tell stories to each other, it helps. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a beautiful question, what should we do? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a beautiful answer. Um, and of course, um, um, Kevin McDonald, thank you very much for coming over. We didn't tell you what to expect. You, you just, you know, you just said sure. If you, uh, if Mohammedu is asking, you know, I'm coming. I'm happy. And you didn't even know where you were getting into. You know, I had no idea. I, he's my magical mystery tour. Yeah. And um, uh, so I, I, I uh, it's I can I cannot thank you enough. You know, for being. You know, we showed part of your movie. It's so difficult to talk about. It's it's so emotional. It's so also in these times. You know, being judged by scenes and parts of it. And I think you know watch the movie it's just amazing I think it's some of the Thank acting you. is so so incredibly good and that's also due to uh, uh, directors because they like <laughs> hear it a little bit <laughs> casting and good actors ca uh, thank you thank you for the, making this happen and I think this was yeah. a really beautiful emotional evening and and I'm so glad I came 
Thank you. So, and, and, and thank you very, very much, of course, Mohamedou, for our artists in residence. We, we're having much more conversations the rest of the year. What are you going to do? We're going to have uh, 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 much more conversations toward, um, I mean, even before the summer, after the summer, somewhere in the autumn and in the winter. So um, uh, uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you, too. You know that. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so I just want to uh, close this because uh, in the name of the Bali, we award uh, my friend Kevin, uh, the best uh, movie director in the world, and <laughs> because I know he likes like African art, so we brought him a piece of art from Mauritania. <laughs> come please, come to the stage. I'd like to thank my agent. No to slap any of us. <laughs> uh, there is no Will Smith here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, guys. We love you guys. Without you, we wouldn't have.